Should your kids play sports in school? If so, how many, which ones? And is today's landscape different from the last 20 years? Well, today we're sitting down with an athletic director at a local high school. This is the New Dad Project podcast. I'm Jack, your host. Today, I'm joined by James Cummings as kind of like a co-host. We did a dedicated podcast with him a few episodes ago, so check that out if you missed it. Michael Turner, athletic director and coach. Today, we dive into that whole world. Thank you so much for joining once again. Let's get into it. <laughs> podcast for young men in pursuit of being better men we're asking dads and dudes from all walks of life the real questions to learn and grow together welcome to the new dad project what is it about coaching that initially attracted you to it and then what have you learned along the way oh my gosh that's massive so uh what initially attracted to me was just this love of baseball that i've had my entire life from who, who the, gave you that? Dad, granddad, my uncle Tom, you know, the Atlanta Braves, the Chicago Cubs, Channel 2 and 3. Like, you know, when when you're not, when you're home and you've got nothing to do, like there's one of those two teams playing at all times when we were young. And then, you know, growing up on Emma line with like all the guys that grew up in our neighborhood, you know, I still grew up, maybe I'm the last generation that grew up playing in the yard, right? So, mm. you know, all of the neighborhood guys, we're playing wiffle ball, we're playing basketball, we're playing baseball, football, we're playing everything there is. And so there's this this love of sport and yeah. when you've got this love of sport sometimes the love of sport isn't matched with ability and i wasn't matched with ability so i love baseball and i just wanted to stay in it as long as i could so that was the initial draw like i want to coach because i still want to be still want to be a part of baseball yeah it never really creeped in my mind about college professional about it being a job or a thing that i did it was this thing that i wanted to do and then once I got involved with it, and the you know the, the I guess the the sticking point here becomes, man, the impact and this this tiny role you play in the course of a kid's life. You know, you see them; they walk in, fourteen years old, maybe they're fifteen years old when they're in the ninth grade, and they're leaving you at seventeen, eighteen, right? Like I mean, that that span of time is amazing, and you know we might not remember who our second grade teacher is. We can doggone sure remember who our high school coaches were, right? The amount of time they're spending them. Yeah. You know, I, I'm with I'm with our kids as much as I'm with my kids, probably more so a lot of times. That's sad, but it's what it is. So, like, once I got into it and I just started to see, like, the relationships that this creates and, like, where you can get them mentally, physically, emotionally even sometimes. So it's... uh. It's not even close to what the classroom provides. Now, I were to say maybe some of the exceptional teachers can probably do that, but I'm not I'm not one of those. Um, but as far as like the coaching aspect goes, it, it's given me way more back than I've even possibly put into it. Sometimes when I sit and I think I've done this for 24 years, I feel like it's year three. I don't feel any different than I felt at the beginning. Um, the preparation is exactly the same. The energy is the same. I can't sleep the night before the first night. It's like Christmas for me, truly. And it's just, it's never wavered. So it's, you know, we're all kind of looking for signs. Am I doing the right thing? And that's always been the one for me. Like, how do I know, how do I know when it's time to get out of the way? Because I mean, I'm a dinosaur in what I do. Like 46 years old, there I'm an old man. And I mean, I feel it at times, but for real, it's the young person's gig because of the ability to, relate and engage and, and keep the kids kind of moving in the right direction. Like, well, you know, a lot of times folks can't do it. Let me ask you a dinosaur question. All right. And I, you know, and we've gotten right into it. You're uniquely positioned, I think, to talk about coaching because, you know, obviously you're the athletic director at West Carteret. You've coached baseball and volleyball now going on 20 plus years. So you've coached with, against, observed probably thousands of coaches over the years, oh, like yeah. literally. Yeah. And, 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 you know, young dads all, a lot of times find themselves getting involved with their kids when their kids get involved in athleticism. And we know with youth sports, you know, it's uh, soccer at four, it's t-ball at five, like, you know, this comes quick. This is a new thing. So I think it'd be really cool if you could tell us, you've seen all these coaches, you've seen all these different styles. Are there any similar characteristics that you've observed in coaches that if you could tell a young dad, you know what, do this, don't do that, do this, don't do that, to help them out. Because 
you know, I, I, I went through this and, and there's a whole lot of lessons you got to learn. The, the biggest one that's the absolute hardest for every dad, um, is failure. Um, I think that we're, I think we're genetically coded maybe to try to keep failure from occurring for our kids. Um, we don't, we don't want them to not get what they want. We don't want them to hurt. Like we don't want them to have to maybe go through things that we went through. So we work religiously at protecting them. And it's like, we, we want to allow them to go engage, but only in the confines that we've kind of created. And, and so that's always the biggest one. Um, I think kids should play everything for as long as they can play it. And we've talked about this, this idea of specification. It just, I can't stand it. it. It drives me, it drives me crazy. It drives me. Well, in, in America, there's this idea that the way that you can become the best is you uh, specify early. So there is enormous, this is crazy, but there is enormous pressure on kids as early as nine and 10 years old to only play baseball, Niche down for to only play soccer. And a lot of that is driven by the travel sports industry because there's so much money being made. Uh, if your kid is in year round soccer, or if he's in year round baseball, you know, those programs are making a lot of money. And so they want to convince you like your kid needs to play all the time. And it is, uh, Michael and I have this uh, saying that play as many as you can, as long as you can. I just believe that, uh, I think, I think middle school and high school athletics is a unique experience that comes and goes. It's like the wind. And, and you're doing yourself a disservice if you don't play as much as you can, including playing sports that you're not good at. I think it's just as important to learn what it's like to be the worst player on the team as the best player. Why? Well, I mean, because, because you're providing a different service to the team, right? The best player on the team, everybody looks at him. He gets all the popularity. That's what everybody wants to be. But how about if you're the number 15 player on a basketball team, all right? So you got to give them looks in practice. You got to, you got to make sure. You can't cause a disruption. You can't complain about playing time. You've got to be there to help out. Like it's different skills, but it's no less important. And I think that we overemphasize the top percent and we don't celebrate people that are just great teammates. But, you know, we, we've, we've talked about this a, a lot and really wish kids would play more sports. And I, I think that's what you're saying is like, let them play everything, let them swim, let them run, let them, even if they're not good at it. They need the experience. Yeah. So the, you know, the other thing that sports does, you know, that you know, dads are protecting from failure and sports provides it. The game of baseball, it's predicated on failure. Like the game doesn't end until somebody's out 27 times or 21 times, depending on what it is. Right. right? Well, the other side of this too is kids have got to learn how to deal with success. You know, when when you're sometimes it ends up sounding personal and i don't i certainly don't mean it to be like but sometimes you've got an overdeveloped nine-year-old mm. and this overdeveloped nine-year-old is out there playing soccer and he's just two steps faster than the other kids and he's stronger and and he's scoring all the goals and all of a sudden well we want him to play on this travel team and he's going to play with 12 year olds and all of a sudden like hey, yeah my kid's playing with the 12 year olds well but that doesn't mean that this kid at 15 at, or right. 16. Correct. You know, here's the. You get early growers. When we're 16 years old, we're dealing with the fumes, car fumes and perfumes, right? Like life changes, man. Life changes at 16. And, you know, I, I tell people all the time, like we've got, we've got really good friends and they're like, well, can you come watch him play? Can you come watch this? Can you come watch that? And I'm like, yeah, I see a 12 year old. I, I see a 12 year old. And like, I don't know how many things we are in love with at 16, we were at 12. Yeah. Like right. I was playing with Legos at 12, right? I was, I was driving a car at 16. We, yeah. Things change. You, you see it. I remember seeing it in baseball. You see it in middle school too. Oh, almost always the best athletes in sixth, seventh, and eighth grade are not the best athletes, junior, senior year, of high school. 100%. Because, uh, what happens is you just have some kids that develop a little bit quicker. Right. But if you develop quicker, a lot of time, that doesn't mean you're going to keep developing at the mm. rate. And uh, that can be really tough on those kids because they get their identity wrapped up in being the best. And then all of a sudden they can't make the team. And that's just a, that's a whole nother deal for them. But and it's also funny too, sometimes with, but and this is true for boys and girls. Like, you know, I've had baseball players that, that came in as ninth graders 
And it's like, okay, guys, you know, kind of run out to the position that you want to show. Like it's tryout day. Like show me where you want to be. And it's like one kid runs the shortstop because he's the shortstop. Right? Like that's the thing. Yeah, yeah. Right. Like, whoa, 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 whoa. guys, we gotta we we can't have one shortstop. Well, 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 Charlie's the shortstop. Charlie's always been the shortstop. Okay, but I don't want to tell anybody else. Maybe Charlie's maybe Charlie's no longer the shortstop. You're all getting stronger and growing, and man, Charlie's not the guy anymore. But like so they've kind of been in this role and and, and especially the kids that, you know, bless their bones, they're on the kind of same team. Right. Like, you know, we've all done it. Like Hey, I'll coach, you coach with me, you coach with me. That way our kids will be together and, you know, it, we'll, we'll have a good time because we're together and our kids will enjoy playing with one another. And, you know, your kid's good, your kid's good. My kid's maybe not so good, but our team will be pretty good because your kids are. So we, we get in this like pack early where they want to play on the same teams. Yeah. And then that kind of lends into this, right? So all of a sudden there's these like defined roles for a kid at 11 that he can't live up to at 16 when everybody's growing. Right. Everybody's had, you know, hit puberty and passed through it. And now it's a game of who really is working the hardest. And, you know, sometimes it's the kids that didn't have a whole lot of success that were willing to stick with it. And, you know, what they've learned is they've kind of learned the ebb and flow and they've learned that you're not going to uh, get a hit every at bat. And so they're prepared mentally for, you know, what's to come. Because, you know, baseball specifically, the beauty of it is it's the one game that if you stick with it, you can be pretty good at it. Mm. You just have to be patient. Like, you know, and it's hard when you're younger because maybe it's not the most exciting thing. Yeah, right. But yeah, the the sticking with it, man, what it provides you on the other end, it's nothing like it. Unpack that a little bit. So, I mean, you've seen thousands of high school athletes come through in a variety of sports. And obviously now as athletic director, you're responsible for, what, 15, 20 teams? I don't know, but... 28. 28 teams. Okay, so... What, uh, just in a nutshell, if you're talking to young parents out there, what, what do you think kids learn in high school athletics? If you could boil it down to three or four things and I, I'm setting you up with a softball there, but, but you know, what, 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 why play, why play high school sports? Why not just study? Oh my gosh. I mean, right. Cause my grades are what are going to get me into college. So why should I even, well, why should I play high school sports? We've got, we've got, you know, hard numbers that we can throw at that person immediately. Right. So. You know, the, the first thing I tell people all the time, why high school athletics? Beautiful question. Number one, your kid's going to do better in school. We have, we have local, we have state, and we have national numbers that support every inch of that. At West Carter High School, the average GPA of a high school athlete is a 3.62. That is a real number. A 3.62 means that kid is making three A's every semester. So we've got success there. Why high school athletics? Well, you have parameters that must be met because it's not a, it's not a right that you just get to be an athlete, right? Like you've got to make the team, you've got to toe the line, you've got to do all the work. So, so, you know, there's responsibilities that come with that. So now behavior is yeah. an issue. We can't just go out and act a fool. All right. We can't be on social media, just, you know, posting just outlandish stuff and calling other people out and drawing attention to ourselves negatively. You know, why high school athletics? Well, we're going to make good grades. We're going to behave. We're going to, we're going to learn about social media in a, in a positive light because it's a tool if we want it to be a tool, but only if we use it such, right? A hammer, it can be a paperweight or in an artisan's hand, it can be something that they do a lot with. So in all things like that, you kind of learn how to, how to use it. Why, why athletics, you know, successes and failures, you're going to learn how to deal with both. Humility is not necessarily ingrained in us. It is something that, you know, we had to, you yeah, right. We have to train ourselves with yeah, that. how to handle failure, man. Yeah. It's 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 real. And then the, the flip of the coin is how do we how do we handle that success? I think that's right. more difficult to manage. I, I agree. I, I say it all the time that it's it's handling success really that's probably more difficult than handling failure simply because okay, I had a good year, now what? Okay, I had a big game, now what? Yeah. Right. Like the moment I slack up, I'm no longer who I was. And now I think, I think failure gives marching orders. It's like uh, we lost. We need to work harder. But after we win, what does that exactly mean? I mean, what 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 message does? Well, I'm better. And I think I think failure gives absolutely clear. That's right. That's you got to get better. You got to get better. Yeah. Success. Not so much. Right. And there's, you know, then the, and the other thing that that athletics does, you know, high school, it, it does go by fast. Right. So. What athletics provides is now, right? Right now, yeah. The moment, the moment you're in, 
the moment you're in is the most important thing. It's right now. It's this pitch or it's this serve. Yeah. It, 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 like this play, like it's right now. The the play that we just had, whether it was good or bad matters not because here we are again yeah. and we're at now. There's nothing else we do in education at any level that teaches us about now right. because education is yeah. correct. Yeah. It's either it's either back here or it's over there, but it's never now. Like we don't study now. We don't have a way to study now. It's true. And athletics is the only thing that teaches now. Being intentional about now. Good. Like it's not it's not easy to be right here. I've seen younger coaches and I don't necessarily roll my eyes because I probably was there too. You know, well, you know, in practice, I put pressure on my kids. Well, tell me about that. How do you, how do you put pressure on your kids? Well, you know what? Before we go back there and we serve this ball, I tell them the score is 23-24. Okay. And that's pressure. Yeah. Why? Like this, the, the court's the same size at 23-24 as it is one-to-one. The net's at the same place. We're playing with the same people. We're wearing the same colored uniforms. Like the, nothing, they're, they're, there's nothing different. So I kind of hear what they're saying. It's a, it's a challenge, right? They're trying to you know create a circumstance where I've put conditions on an event to make them overcome obstacles. I hear that, but that's not creating pressure. All you're doing is you're creating an environment. But what you really need to be, in my opinion, teaching all of those kids is it's now. It's just it's being intentional about being right here, mm. right now. Not, none of this other stuff that's going on matters. I love volleyball now. Who would have ever thought that would be my thing? But one of the things that I love about volleyball when I watch our kids play is the gym itself. There's always this din of noise. There's always this sound. And as rallies continue where the ball has switched sides two or three times, there is this collective inhaling going on with the moms and the dads. And it's like building. And I'm just sitting there going, they're so worried about what this outcome is going to be that they're completely losing, like, what's right here in front of them, man? Like, this is amazing. Yeah. Like, it's awesome what's going on. And, like you know, and then, you know, you, you give up a couple points and you kind of hear, come on, let's go. And it's, I mean, you know, that, James and I are Carolina basketball fans, and mm -hmm. the number of text messages and arguments. Of, Jack, Jack went to a game last year. Man, go, go Heels. Go Heels. Go Heels. So the the number of conversations, text messages, arguments, <laughs> bloviation that has occurred over just Roy Williams calling a timeout. And so, like, I, I am also one of the school of, I don't, I don't call a lot of timeouts. Like, I want to see how we respond, man. You guys don't need me out there. Like, there's, I don't know what to tell you. The other team is trying to win, too. And they're, they're also trying to score points. So, like, they scored seven points before we score five. What's my timeout going to do? Like, I'm trying to train these kids into being right here, right now. Yeah. I call a timeout. Now we're focused on what was happening or what's going to happen. And it's not right now. I got another softball for you. <laughs> Gosh. So you've, uh, so I, I think this is really important for dads because I've had a little taste of this, but not much, but you have coached volleyball females <laughs> and you've coached baseball, all males. Yeah. Right. And you, I know this cause we've talked about it. Those are very different things. Coaching a group of girls and coaching a group of boys. Is there any advice you could pass on to dads? Like, you know, Hey, you're getting ready to coach your first U8 all girls soccer team versus your first, you know, U6 all boys soccer team. Like those are different teams. Completely. Completely different. And so if you, any advice you could give to young dads out there that, uh, you know, maybe they, maybe they got two girls, maybe they got a girl and a boy, but, but as you coach that, you're coaching different things. Great question. The, the first thing you're doing, no matter what, is you're loving. Okay. Right. Um, that's and, and that's gotta be your bedrocks. Is it different coaching boys and girls? Yes. I, I love Pat Summit. Read a lot of stuff. Coaching's coaching. I respect you. I don't know that. I don't know that I'm there. I don't know that I'm in that school. Um, but bedrock is love, right? Like the, the minute that they know that you love them, like you can point them in the right direction, right? But when you go coach that group of little girls, literal, it is going to be a literal reaction to your words. Because they listen. They listen. They're listening. They're listening to every word. They're listening to every word, and then they're turning and looking at you after every play. So, young dad out there getting ready to coach that group of little girls, stay 
Uh, can the, not react. You cannot react. I am. A, they are interpreting that emotionally. I am. Gr I am a grown man, and I have to do everything I can. And I'm coaching 16, 17, 18 year old young women, and they are apex predators, and they are competitive, and they are dogs. But when there is a mistake made, they're looking at me, and I have to. I have to be ready to tell them that it just doesn't matter. And we have to move to the next play yeah. because they want to, they want to please everyone. Right. All right. They want to please me as if they're ever going to disappoint me. They want to please mom and dad. They want to please teammates. They want to make sure that the reason why I'm out here on the floor is because that I can do this thing. So, you know, and that, that started at an early age. That didn't just happen when they got older. So, you know, the, the young dad, like the reaction is the most important thing that mm -hmm. can happen. Uh, the outcome matters not like the outcome matters not. It's just all about like love them. That's got to be bedrock. And when they turn and look, that's what they've got to see. It's love. Mm -hmm. They've got to see it. What's different about boys? It's young men. Yeah. Okay. First of all, they're not listening. Not even a little bit. They are like uh, little heat seeking missiles <laughs> and you've always got to point them in the direction of a heat source. Uh, yeah. So. <laughs> So boys are, I mean, they're both so equally fantastic, right? Right. You know, when, when you're, when you're coaching the little boys, their attention and getting their attention is the priority because yeah, that's great. hard, right? It, like, it's actually a skill. It, totally. Learning to get them to, I had a counselor one time teach me if you want them to listen, talk softly, which is completely counterintuitive. Great. That's right. But if you want, if you want a group of six boys to listen to you, don't scream. That's what they do in the SAS, apparently. Super soft. That's interesting. Because you, they've got to, they've got to strain, they've got to like focus in, huh. and you know the the boys are all battling something shiny, right? That's right. Like, yeah, like whatever can get their attention, gets their attention. So, you know, I think what happens from what I've seen with young boy or like younger sports with boys specifically, yeah. I think a lot of times we start to lose them collectively because there's generally one ball, and and they and they struggle, they struggle waiting their turn. They struggle for when they're, when, when they get to do the thing that we're all doing right now. Yeah. And then they want to, they, like the question that they ask is like, is it my turn or my next or whatever, yeah. as opposed to like, you know, yeah. that line, I guess is the hard one there. So I think for young dads, when it's, when we're coaching boys, surround yourself with other dads. Like, don't think that like, you're the guy that's going to get it done because the, the more help we can get, like, we're going to keep their attention. We don't ever want one activity going on right like the i mean shoot when i was growing up it was all right everybody comes up coaches pitch and bp everybody gets their seven swings and then in, in the outfield who knows what's going on right like it's the it's the jungle out there like you're knocking people down to try to catch the fly ball or yeah. who knows what's going on so you know i think there's a i think you've got to surround yourself with good people and keep their attention but the other beauty of the little boys is just how hard they're going to compete yeah. Yeah. Day one. That's right. Holy moly. It is. I mean, it's crazy how hard they want to go, especially if there are little brothers on the team. Like when oh, you start goodness, getting a man. second kid. Yeah. I remember that. Who's had to scrap for everything. For everything. <laughs> for the clean towels. You're going to eat. Like work to sleep on. Give, give me a team of second brothers. Dude. That it. Yeah. It is. Yeah. So you. So this is, this is leading me to a different direction, but you know, uh, obviously my kids came through and played at West Carter and I've, I've been involved with youth sports and I coached my kids heavily early. And, uh, but you know, around middle school, as we went into high school, I kind of stepped back and I quit coaching. And it was my belief at that point was that being a parent was enough. And, uh, sometimes you can get blurred between coach and dad, and, but I've seen, I've seen parents super successful in coaching their own kids all the way through, uh, but any advice for, for parents as to how long to stay involved coaching your kids, what that looks like. I mean, I, I don't know that there's a, there's one simple answer here. It's probably unique to everybody, but just, if you could just kind of speak to, you know, what have you seen along the way with, uh, you know, parents being involved, how long they should stay involved how they should be involved and, and just kind of what that looks like. I can give you my, my personal story is in 24 years of being a high school coach. And, you know, I was coaching before I was a, a teacher. I mean, I've been, I guess I've been coaching since I was a senior in high school. So what do you teach by the way? Teach high school math. So 
I mean, I'm on 30 ish years of doing this and I can tell you the two worst jobs that I've ever done was coaching my son in high school because I was completely irrational, right? Like, mm -hmm. you know, the bedrock is love, right? Yeah. My bedrock wasn't love with that guy in that moment Wow. because like I knew there's ultimate, there's, there's pressure automatically on me because he's on my team. Even though, like, in the pantheon of West Carter athletes at one time that I've been there, no one has sacrificed more for West Carter than Braden Turner. No one. Except maybe his sister and their mom. Like, no one else has sacrificed more than, than because of family. You've never been around. Because, I mean, right. I mean, like, I, it's sometimes it, and it, when you get still and you get quiet and you think about some things sometimes, like, that one haunts me. So I, there was pressure on me because he was on my team. You know, well, he's on your team because he's your kid. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. He made the team. It was all good. But, you know, bless his bones, as he came along, I never I never pushed him. So it's almost like you and I had opposite tracks, right? Like I never coached some of his teams, but I never pushed him because I was always afraid that if I pushed him and he didn't like it, there was going to be resentment. Yeah. Right? And, like, for me, the way I was raised, my dad was – Hard's not really the word. Stern's probably the word. You know, there was never a doubt in my mind my dad loved me, but I was probably in my mid-20s before I ever realized my dad was proud of me. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a, there's a kind of difference in there. So, you know, I was I never wanted that for my relationship with my kid. Like, I want him to, to kind of know where we're at. So because I hadn't pushed him, maybe he missed his window a little bit. And so when he wasn't as good as I wanted him to be right then, it was like it became personal and what i mean it's it's like i had taken on you know him like once he's in high school he's his own animal he's he's the product of his decisions we got him and we lead him and we try to put him in the right places doing the right things right. but like they're turning left or they're turning right how many dads do you think i mean I, I think it's a very loud archetype the dad that's living through his kid pushing him <laughs> troy bolton's dad <laughs> but you're touching on something different which is the dad that is scared of that and doesn't push their son enough no i mean there i have had conversations about it and, and there's luckily for us there's no regret so i mean like i'm happy about that because of where we are now but how did you navigate those conversations did you bring them up or was yeah, it yourself? i had conversations with him after his first year of high school after the the first baseball team that he played on i said i'm done like I, i'm not i'm you, you were aware of it in the in the it's not like hindsight that i was and i couldn't fix it Huh. And I knew, I don't know that he was aware of how bad I was. Wow. And I told him, I was like, I'm done. Like, I'm, I am going to, I'm going to retire so that I can watch you and be your dad. And I can be proud of you and pull for you. And I don't have to coach you. And, you know, what I thought I was going to get back was awesome. I look forward to that. Or, yeah, I think that's a great idea. Right. And what I got back instead was, you're not putting that on me. Like you're not, you're not retiring because of me. Like I've waited, I've waited my whole life to get here. We're going to spend some time together. That's right. Yeah. That's yeah. correct. And and so He's owned it. I think I was better year two than I was year one, but I was brutal year one. And it, yeah. I mean, parents are going to parent. There's nothing like I try to, as an athletic director, I try to explain to our coaches all the time. It doesn't matter how hard you try, your lines of communication, how much you communicate or whatever, parents are going to parent. And I try not to, it's hard sometimes, I try not to ever take it personal. I try to always keep in mind that they're just being a parent. Let them be a parent for a little bit and let's see if we can circle back to, you know, what's actually taking place here. But my goodness, it is, uh, it's not hard sometimes. And, you know, I don't know. I don't know that I've seen a lot of folks that I thought were good coaches for their kids. Well, it's it is first of all being a coach is hard enough, and then you know to coach a kid, you know obviously especially if you're we're talking about high school where we're we're at an advanced level. Yep. It's just it's really difficult not to have a blind spot. Even even the coaches that I coached with a lot of dads obviously almost all the people i coached with their kid was on the team and um it's just really hard to be objective i mean it's, it's brutal because to your point 
you know, you not only are you trying to be strategic, not only with playing time and positioning, but you know, you want your kid to succeed because, yeah. you know, we all have that nature. We shield them from failure. Mm -hmm. And so I think that, uh, I think that if I'm a young dad out there, you know, I, I think it's an art knowing how long to, to help coach and, and when to step back. I, I think, I, I don't think there's one simple answer, but, uh, you know, I, I do believe at some point you need to let them be coached by somebody else. Yeah. And I think the, where the line where you start to kind of figure out maybe if you're a young dad and you're coaching your kid, like, how do I know when it's time for someone else to do it? I would say that when the results matter more to you than the kid, probably it's probably time now. That's good. Um, you know, that's really good. When Braden gets in the car and he played his little league game and, you know, he had three at bats and maybe he didn't get a hit in three at bats. And I say, how was the game? Great. Then it's great. Yeah. There, there and so you, there's a part of you that's like, what do you mean? You were over three. Like you could have, you could have hit that pitch away or like there's things you could no, no. Like what a great way to look at it. It was great. Yeah. I got to play with my buddies. Like it was baseball. I had a great time. Like it's yeah. awesome. I loved it, dad. And so like, for me, it was like, all right, yeah. Okay. What else would I want it to be? Like, why would I want him dwelling on that bats? Because we can't do anything about it. Yeah. You, so. You no, know, I got a, I got a buddy that says uh, we no longer raise our kids around the dinner table, we raise them behind the windshield. Right. It, what, what he means by that is that uh, kids today in sports they play a lot of sports. Yeah, like like when I was growing up, I mean it was like six little league football games, eight rec basketball games, and probably twelve baseball games. And maybe you had one practice a week, and, <laughs> and that was the game. sum total of your athletic season and now with travel sports man when my kids were nine and ten years old they were playing 40 to 50 soccer games a year oh my gosh you know baseball travel baseball oh i mean you could kids can easily bang out 60 baseball games a year <laughs> au basketball uh <laughs> you, know, you know 40 to 50 basketball games a year i mean i, I mean this is so kids play a lot but so what he was saying is uh you're, you're not home for dinner anymore. right you're on the road so so let's talk about what we're going to talk about behind that windshield. Because I, I think I distinctly remember many conversations with my kids coming home from Rock Hill, South Carolina, from a, a basketball tournament or Rocky Mount, or maybe we're down in Myrtle Beach for soccer. Any advice for young dads on, on one, how do we handle ourselves after a big loss? Yeah, it's good. Uh, how do we handle ourselves after a win? And how do, how do we make advantage? You know, how do we take advantage? The first thing I tell all dads is tell them for half the ride, keep the phones off and, and try to get them to talk to you because it's really the only time you'll have them captive. Any advice to, to, to dads, parents, coaches on, on making the most of that windshield time? Man, that the phone is such, you know, most of my life's been on a bus, right? So like, I didn't get a lot of that windshield time that you're talking about. A lot of mine was windshield time sitting on a, you know, polyester seat. But like, it, it is interesting to me as I think back to kind of what you're talking about, like it's, it's interesting that when we lost the big game, it probably was more kids on the bus than if we won the big game. Really? Yeah. Were your parents on taking the kids home? I think it's more along the lines of, I don't know that the kids necessarily wanted to ride home with their parents sometimes when we lost lost a big game i think that wow. like they they look they or, knew what was coming they, they look coming. They, well or maybe they look for the solace with their teammates or they just kind of wanted to be and, and like let, if we're going to be miserable about, about it let's be miserable together but i right. think really what happens honestly is and we've lost we've lost a lot of games they get on the bus maybe they're kind of quiet while we're in the parking lot but by the time we're out on the open road i mean they they've let it go yeah like they, they've let it go. And that, that makes me proud. I guess there, really do. there's a part of me sometimes that wants them to hold on to it a little bit sure. longer than, cause I, you know, I don't want it to sound like I'm some like Zen. I'm not like the anxiety and indigestion and headache and heartache like that I go through in the course of a year is, is as real and as unhealthy as it can get. Um, and then the, the face that I had to try to make on the side. Yeah, right. So not offend the, 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 the
Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's 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 hard sometimes, but um, yeah, like I, you know, I think that they let it go. You know, I would say, you know, as I got a little bit older and was traveling with Braden a little bit more, I and honestly we talked about anything else. We 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 talked about really it was one of the only times we could talk about school, like class, what's going on, like how are we doing in class, how do you like that teacher, like what are the kids saying about this, like what are your thoughts on you know whatever's going on at West Carter and that and you know, I used him as kind of my barometer of what was going on because you know parents need to know that that time in the car is gold it, it is and really you know, especially I, when they get older talking to you know you're talking about the you know the, the games I think parents are taking advantage of it. You're not the only one. Like, you know, we've got some friends that their kids are traveling. Like, they're really using that time, like, on the way to practice because maybe they're not playing, you know, close. Like, that's where they're they're getting, like, captivated time mm. where it's just them and nobody can ever take that back from them. And, you know, I mm. think for the young dads, like, talk about what they want to talk about. Yeah. Like, let them drive the conversation. Figure out how to to weave in the little lessons that you want them to know along the way, but you've got to let them drive the conversation because if if you're driving the conversation, you're going to find that you're talking more than they're talking. Yeah, you talk, yeah, yeah, and that's a little tone off too. Just get them to talk. So, what kind of questions are you asking? You know, what like what's going on in class? Like, what class do you like? What's your favorite teacher? Like, which one do you not really like? What's going on with your girlfriend or with your friend group? And because their friend groups are always kind of changing a little yeah, bit, yeah, right. So, you know, that those were the kind of questions that I was asking him. And then once he started talking, I mean, just like any other male, I mean, the three of us, if we're not going off a list of questions, there's no telling what we're talking about in seven minutes. Right. Yeah. And so, <laughs> and so that that's what would happen. And all of a sudden, you look yeah. up, and you know we had left Greenville, and now we're you know now we're coming through Newburn, and it's like right. where did the last hour go? Yeah. Um. And so you know that, that stuff was always fantastic, but you know it was always just trying to get him to talk and letting him talk, because I mean think about think about what school's like, right? From kindergarten to the twelfth grade, like maybe it gets a little better in high school because we're really trying to reverse education and get them to talk a little bit more, but. They, they got to be quiet. They got to be yeah. quiet in the hall. They got to be quiet in the lunchroom. I mean, like you go sit with your kid in third grade and there's red and green cups on the table letting you know when you can talk and when you can't talk. Don't get me started. Like, so they're it's ingrained in mm. them to just not talk. Just let them talk. And I'll be honest with you. I mean, there were times when he was younger where he was talking about, I don't even know what the name of the characters were, some game that he was playing. And I mean, like, I'm in my mind going, I have no idea what he's talking about, but I just got to let him go. I got to let him tell me about it. Like, I want to say they were Zoolanders or something, but I don't know that that's the name of them. But man, he would go. He would go. I made you some uh, quick quick hitters here. Yeah. I'll ask you a couple of questions. Um, man, I'm super curious with the generations that you've seen come through. Is there a difference in young men, how they were when you started teaching versus how they are now? If so, what, what are some of those differences that you've seen uh, over the years kind of come through here? So I'm going to, I'm probably not going to give you the answer that you expect. Don't think kids are that different. I truly don't. I think the environment around them is different. And I'm going to give you an example. Like everybody my age or older wants to blame the downfall of society on cell phones. Because it's in the palm of their hand, they're getting their endorphin kicks from, you know, the immediate gratification of a like or whatnot on yeah. on a on a Facebook post yeah. or a tweet or something. Well, when James and I were twelve, well, he's much older than I am. When when James was fifteen and I was eleven, chances of the two of us being with three other buddies at somebody's house, playing Zelda or Nintendo with a Pizza Hut pizza and a Mountain Dew was probably pretty great. That was the technology of the time, and we were circled around it, and we were playing it, right? So I, I don't know that kids are that much different from when I started in the fall of 2000 until I sit here today. I think the environment is different. I think hmm. the, what is the word? I, I think that consequences of actions as as the generations have come through, people are so worried that a consequence is critical 
and they're a lot of times I call them nothing burgers. Like, like in two years, this is an absolute nothing burger that you're not even going to think about anymore. But because of right here, right now, it's like we're worried that because that book report was late into fourth grade that we're going to get a B and we're not going to get into Carolina. Yeah. Like, right? But They tell you that, though. But, but It's all over. Well, does it matter? I mean, does Carolina, it does, does Carolina not let a kid in because they forgot to turn in a book report to fourth grade? They're not. Well, no. I, I, I talked about this a little bit with Jack before. I do think that mistakes are amplified because all your buddies have a camera. And not only that, they have the ability yeah. to, to put it up on a social media platform. Right. And, um, and I, I think that unfortunately all the kids think like, I mean, as a kid, like you want to think like you're, you know, you're doing it better than your parents did it. But we really took from these kids, the ability, I think, to make a mistake. I, th I think that they're a little more fearful, fearful. I think they're a little more timid because their mistakes can be captured. That's that's great. Right. And, um, I, you know, I don't know, have you seen that change? And I, I know, and I know this cause my kids came through West Carter. I know that you harp on social media. Yeah, if you could maybe just talk a little bit about the advice you give kids with social media and, you know, how we go use social media in high school. You know, I always think back to, like, mm -hmm. I was taught how to handle a gun by my granddad. And the lessons that I was taught, I carried with them my whole life. So, you know, like with a, with a firearm, like generations, generations, generations have had firearms, so you've learned gun safety through time. But, like, right. now, where we are right now, where this is a challenge is that there's no wise old man to social media. Man, that's, that's brilliant. Every wow. time we think we have a grip on it, the next thing comes out and it turns into the Wild West again, right? So Facebook became, Insta became, Snapchat correct. became. Yeah, it's just this immediate, wow. like, boom, it's out there. So, you know, and you find yourself having to tell, like, kids, at an early age, right? Like we're not talking about this is high school centric. No, man, we're talking about like fifth grade, fifth grade, sixth grade. Like a lot of times, you know, kind of sixth grade is that that age where you're thinking about giving your kid a phone for the first time because the sixth grade they're starting to stay after school for activities. Maybe they're on a sports team. Maybe they're going home with a friend. Like things are starting to change a little. Well, bit. it's actually convenient for the parent that, that you can track your kids. So also a thing. So. As that gets introduced, it's like we've got to learn mm. safety along with it because, you know, yeah, the mistakes are amplified, but if it's a social media mistake, so social media. I, I think I think what you just said was brilliant. That like, of course, our grandfather knew how to knew how to teach us how to handle a firearm. He knew how to teach us when we were crossing a fence, you know, where to put the rifle, to hop over the fence without the rifle, go get it, like. Those were universal time-tested truths. And I think it's brilliant what you've said that social media has evolved so fast that there's really not some hard set of hard set of rules that, that we can give to parents to say, when you give them a phone at six, you know, give them these six or eight rules. That's right. I've heard things That's about right. like, if you read for 30 minutes, you can have your phone for 30 minutes. You've yep. got monitor and screen time. Uh, we did a thing where they, they got to get an app at every birthday. The, the, you know, when they were in seventh grade, they got the phone. Eighth grade, they could pick up one app. So they got to pick up, like, uh, I think it was Instagram at that point. The next year, we let them get another app. But you got anything like that? Just Yeah, so it's old, important. Old man used to always say about pretty much anything, inspect what you expect. So, hmm. you know, this idea that, like, we give a kid a phone that, like they're gonna, it's their phone. No, and they're just gonna do right by. It. Nah, yeah, no, we got, we go, we go, how to, we go, how to look at what's going on in there. And sometimes we're not gonna like what we see, and we'll have to deal with that when we get there. But yeah. I mean, yeah, you're gonna have a, you gotta, you gotta look and see. And every now and then, you might run into a case where somebody may just be saying some things that they're just internalizing that they have no business internalizing, mm -hmm. and, and that's where we've kind of got a parent, and that's where we've got to protect and. You know, I worry more about that stuff than I do what could be out there as far as like bad guys on the internet. I mean, I don't, I don't, yeah. I, mean, I know it's real. I do know it's real, but I'm more worried about like what's getting said. What's the, what, you know, what are they saying to one another in there? Because, you know, my wife is, she is just be kind. Like you can always be kind. Like there are a lot of things that we can't do, but we can always be kind. 
And so, you know, I think that's been one of the ones that, that we've kind of like lived by and spec what you Yeah, expect. one of the other, I should tell my kids, if you type it on your phone, you need to pretend that it's going to be on the front page of the newspaper. Yeah, yeah that's good. Because anybody has the ability to screenshot it and share it and distribute it and post it on their social media. And, you know, your thoughts are private until they're not. Right. And mm -hmm. when they're not, it's the moment that you type your thoughts in a phone. And, and the person that you think loves you today... Trust me. Yep. <laughs> Trust me. In seven weeks, she might love another. And when she does, she may share some of the thoughts that you thought were private. So people wore bell bottoms. Never forget people wore bell bottoms. Like that's not a lapse in judgment. I, I think people are wearing them again, but again, like it's thin, guys. So we got to limit the screen time. We got to inspect the phones. I think, uh, I think we need to make sure that they understand that anything they type on their phone is fair game for them. And the other time, the other thing too, and, and I'm like, I'm like this with like my actual friend, friend group. If we go out to dinner, if the three of us go to dinner, I'm putting my phone face down on the table. I'm expecting you to do it as well. Yeah. If you pick your phone up, you're buying dinner. Yeah. Like we're here together. Let's be together. Let's not worry about the people that aren't here. Let's just be here and be together. And, and so like, I've tried to pass that along. I don't know how good that's taken, you know, because I do look at them. I'm getting ready to go to Carolina with a group of kids. And, you know, every time we go to camp, they can have their phone. They can have their phone in their room. I have no problem with them having their phone in their room. But when we go eat, whatever meals we go to, if they have their phone, I expect it to be face down on the table. I'd rather it not even be out because I don't want it drawing their attention from 30 minutes where we can talk about whatever we want to talk about, right? When we're in the gym, like I better not see it. I don't need, you don't need to know what time it is. You don't need to see if, you know, your boyfriend texted you back. We'll worry about that later. So I think that, I, I think. Yeah, it's boundaries. The boundaries of what can be on the phone, I think, are important. But I think the boundaries of when, when they get on the phone. phone are equally important. You know what? I, I just yeah. thought about something that I'd never thought about till this moment. You know, emotions tend to take us out of the moment. You and I have talked about yeah. that uh, when we are upset or angry, we're thinking about something in the past that something did or didn't happen. And then if we're, I mean, if we're anxious, we're nervous, it's about something that may or may not happen in the future. So emotionally, we're always coming out of the moment. I never thought about this till right now. I think with cell phones, they're also taking us out of the moment because they're taking us physically somewhere else. All of a sudden, you know, you and I are having this conversation and I'm, I'm looking at Facebook and I see that Susie's eating a piece of pie at some <laughs> restaurant in New York. Like, why, 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 why do I need to be teleported to your vacation or yep. teleported to your family? And, and it, I think that it's just another way. So if emotions take us out of the moment, I think social media takes us out. Of the moment. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Just taking pictures. I had this conversation with my kid, uh, two days ago, my sweet man in college died, um, stomach cancer. One of my best buddies, he, I told, I, I put this big, long post on Facebook and I tried to describe it. He and I had nothing, nothing in common, man. I mean, he was, uh, he was from the big city of Greensboro and I was from Moorhead city. Uh, uh, he was black and I was white. He liked rap and I liked Southern rock. Uh, he was a Democrat. I was a Republican. You know, he, he liked to wear his leather jacket and go clubbing. And, you know, I, I like to drink beer at trolls and players. I mean, literally outwardly, there's not, there was no reason for us to be buddies, except that when you go college and you live with somebody and we didn't have cell phones, well, you sit around drinking beer. And when you drink a beer, you start talking. That's right. And when you start talking, you start laughing. And when you start laughing, you start crying, and you start talking, and you start drinking beer, and you start laughing, and you start talking. The next thing you know, you figure out that we're all way, way, way more alike than we are different. We just are. Yeah. And I really hate how the world's kind of divided us. But I posted this, yeah. and I sent it to my kid, who's in college right now. And he texted me back. He said, and this was his response. He said, I got to get off my phone. This moment in college is getting ready to end. Me and all my buddies, we don't need to be on our phones. We need to be enjoying each other. And I just thought about, wow. I mean, when I was going through college, if, you know, maybe I wouldn't have gotten to know this guy as well if, if we could just doom scroll in our rooms. So to all the young people out there, realize that, that that phone ain't real. I mean, that ain't life. When you look back on college and laugh and tell stories about the dumb shit you did, never will it begin with. I was on my phone looking at Instagram. Yeah, and it will be. It might start with we'd been drinking all day. It might end up on Instagram. Or I've been studying all night. But 
gosh, life is capture the moments, post the moments, but don't ever believe that that those are the, that those are the moments. That's good, man. Yeah, that's, that's a clip. That, that's for sure. Okay, go ahead. That's your closer question. You're with me too. Well, hold on. I got a question. I got a question for you before any kind of closer right. question. Yeah. All right. So baby's due in November. Baby's born. We're going to be in the hospital a day, maybe two. All things go right. Sure. Okay. Do you know that when you leave the hospital that you have to drive home? You know, I've thought about that. I need you to think about how fast you're going to drive. So I live three minutes from the hospital, 35 it, it, miles. It might take you 12 minutes. And it might take me 12 minutes. I can tell you, I lived on 20th Street and when they put Braden in the car. And I mean, like, was so... I don't know how, I don't know what having a kid is like now. The technology has all changed, but when we had Braden, we had this thing in the car that stayed in the car that had been put in there by the fire department. Like, I feel like, I feel like we had the fire department, the police department, the Coast Guard Auxiliary inspect this bench to make sure that it was in there correct. We put Braden in a thing and it locked into the thing that's in the car. I had the, so scary. I had the hazard lights on. Famous, man. And there's no way I drove more than 20 miles an hour from Carter at General. To Cambridge Downs. There's no way I drove more than 20 miles an hour. Has lots the whole way. Taking every back road I could think of just to not be on the main road. Man, um, even just driving Lauren around, my my sweet wife, who I really loved, yeah. and it kind of freaks me out thinking about her driving around. She's got a little baby in there, man. It's, it's so scary. It's the realest real there's ever been. I do not know there's, how to there's describe. A, there's a switch. There's it's, a switch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're ready. Like, it's it's okay. Like, it, you're going to be ready. It happens. It, and it happens. It, it, so there's a switch like they that baby comes out and mama me. stays over there and you and the baby are going to this little tape yeah it's i mean it, it's like it did i don't know what to tell you your life's just yeah before you. who you were and who you are or not there's this there's before and there's an off there is yeah. do you um how do you how do you move past that? i mean do you just get do you grow in confidence do you grow in i guess releasing control or do you grow in an understanding of, um, I guess this like baby's more, a little bit more uh, resilient than I thought. It's probably, you know a little, it's probably a little bit of all of those things, you know, and hopefully, hopefully this is the first child and not the child, right? Um, and you, you probably heard everybody talk about that. Like, the second child, we just let them eat off the floor. Like, the lessons yep. we learn after child number one, right? right. The questions yeah. we ask the doctor for child number one, yeah. I wish we had written them down. <laughs> like uh, some of them are just like, what it? Uh, yeah, so I I think it's all of them. I think that having a child, like there 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 is like nervousness because you're afraid you're gonna mess up. You're not. You're just not. And every single stage of parenthood and your child's childhood, you are prepared for every stage, and you are prepared for the end of that stage yeah. because it leads into the next stage. You're constantly prepared. The only thing that I'm going to tell you is this. You're going to find, boy or girl, do you know, do we do we care? We don't know. Okay, We're cool. waiting. You're going to find, oh. there's going to be a moment that you're laying on the floor playing with your child. Yeah. It's going to be month, two months, three months old. And you're going to find yourself say, I can't wait until, don't finish the sentence. Don't allow yourself to finish the sentence, man. Because every single stage, every time you think, if we can just get, get a out, body train, yeah, if we can just, they just learn to, if walk. they can just walk, if they can just tell us what's wrong, they can just give themselves a yeah, path. yeah, 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 yeah. Yep. And and, I, and I'm gonna tell you this: I thought I was okay at every single stage, and there was one that I was that the the one stage that I was not prepared for was watching him drive away the first time. Done. I had done so good with so much stuff, but watching him drive away was, for me, that was the one where I was like, I mean, just like, oh, I don't know what to do with myself. Yeah. But that's, so, I mean, that was at 16. So, How old your girl? She is 11. So we have an 18 year old and 11 year old because yeah. we didn't want to retire. All right. So this is, this is the last question you asked me, Jack. Can I ask him? Is the, you know, this parenting thing is intergenerational. So, uh, what was the one thing your dad taught you that you knew you were going to teach your kids or Braden or your Oh. What was the one thing that you knew definitively you wanted to pass down? No matter what, you have to be tough. No matter what. It doesn't matter what the situation is. 
It doesn't matter what was said. It doesn't matter what you have to do, but you have to be tough. You have to straighten your back. You have to dig your feet in and you have to be tough. It's not always easy. And that was like, I, I, I mean, he gave me a lot of things, but he gave me that for sure. Wow. Like it was, again, he was a hard man. You got to be tough. He raised me to be tough. He raised me to be willing to, I mean, like, you know, I say it, you got to be willing to fight. I'm not talking about like physically start swinging, but you got to fight. Like I'm not a person that is just going to let things be when I know they can be better or different. So I, I've tried to continue to pass that along. Michael, thank you, man. Of course. I feel, uh, yeah, so help, man. I feel, uh, yeah, I mean, you've helped kind of open my mind to so many things I didn't even think I'd have to have my mind open to down the line. There's more out there. Um, now this won't even be the last time. If you're open to it, I want to just continue these conversations. I'm sure so many people will be so helped by it.